The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. It is people's first. In the past 10 years, as always, we'll come up with a figure. Mm. You know, that figure first. That's not what people want. People want people first, their service first. And then the percentage will then get worked out. Then, later on the agenda. It ultimately came down to, for me, the government refusing to provide meaningful long-term supports to rural practices. And I rationalized that it is not my personal responsibility to uphold an underfunded medical system. Also tonight, the group captured dozens of marbled crayfish at the site in the months that followed. However, wiping out these rapidly self-cloning crustaceans would need a tougher approach. Anyone elected mayor of Canada's largest city inevitably faces an astonishing to-do list. That was perhaps doubly true for the city's 66th mayor, Olivia Chow. Taking over in a by-election last summer, in the midst of an affordability and housing crisis, and on the heels of a pandemic, she was elected on the promise to do things differently, including raising taxes. And since she was sworn in, it's been nonstop, featuring some surprising cross-partisan wins. Here for more, Her Worship, the Mayor of Ontario's capital city, welcome Olivia Chow. You Hello. and I were just chatting before we started this and realized that we have known each other for almost 40 years, because I remember first covering you on school board, and now here you are in our studio for your first interview as mayor, so thank you and welcome. And we're both young at heart. Well, you are anyway. <laughs> I think I suspect I'm an old fogey, but anyway, away we go. Today's your 240th day in office. Let me just ask a very neutral question to get us started. How's the ride been so far? It's been excellent. It's, uh, it's exciting. It's joyous. Uh, last night, I had the good fortune to meet with the staff. There were like 250 of them, women staff of the City of Toronto. Earlier in the day, I met with all the senior staff and hearing about how how positive they're feeling because they are saying that we no longer have to worry about uh, all the cutbacks we were under for 10 years. We, the, the trimming, yes, but not the entire department. Mm. Uh, we are now uh, looking at delivering their service better. Okay, let's follow so up it, on that. It's, so it's growing, it's giving them the confidence to say the public wants you to do better. So what's better right now that wasn't the way it was 240 days ago? Well, TTC, no fare increase, but the service have increased. Okay. You look at the traffic over at King Street, uh, it was completely blocked. Uh, the King Street car traveling from Bathurst to Jarvis takes almost an hour. Hmm. Sometimes some journalists said that a turtle might be faster than that. And um, now we've cut that by uh, dramatically by a third. So it's three times faster now, the King Street car. So the traffic flow in, in, in the, on King Street, for example, because of the traffic agent we hired recently are doing their magic. So uh, congestion, we still have a big problem because of all the construction of Ontario Line and all of that, because it's a growing city, we, we have to do that. So, but in terms of housing, housing starts. Remember, there were a long period that we haven't, there was no shuffle going into the ground. Mm -hmm. And during the campaign, uh, every candidate was saying, where is this Housing Now program? You're seeing housing start now. You're seeing massive investment to building housing. It's faster, we're doing more of it, and a good percentage of them are affordable. Let me, so let me pick so up in the, those things, we are really progressing. You see improvements. Yeah. On the other hand, I can walk 100 yards to the corner at Young and Eglinton here and see that bloody Eglinton Crosstown LRT over budget, past schedule, with no apparent plan to finish it still. What do we do about that? I know that's not really your responsibility, it's Metrolinx's, but still, it's, it, it's right in the middle of the capital city, and nothing, it, it looks like nothing's happening. 
When's it going to be done? Steve, I need you to ask that question to the Premier. You're right, Metrolink. We have absolutely no control over Metrolink. And I'm just as frustrated as you are because they, they're they many years behind, over budget, <laughs> over time. But the city, we'd have no control over it. Metrolink is 100% provincial. Can't you go up there and knock some heads together or something? Would that I, do any I good? I can't knock any heads because we're not responsible for hiring anybody in uh, Metrolink. We want Metrolink to look at how they are constructing the Ontario line. Why are they closing the street for that long? Can they open some of it? And can they speed up the, the building of that subway? Because what's frustrating that I'm hearing from people in the financial district, for example, is congestion, right? They're looking at, wait a second, they just close off Queen Street. Hang on, there's no activities. Can we not have more shift? Can we look at opening streets that don't need to be closed for the time being, close them when we need to. And what's the answer to that? Can it be done? I don't know. I'm not getting clear answer, mm. but we're very thankful mm. for the Premier, by the way, because they're building the subways, the LRTs, and all of that. It's, mm. it's so much needed. We're very glad that's happening. You were on this program back in 2016, and we discussed at that time some very disturbing comments that you were getting on social media. This was when you ran for mayor the first time in 2014. And I, I asked you why you wanted to know what the public was saying about you. I know there's a lot of politicians who just simply block or mute or do whatever, but you actually wanted to know what people were saying out there, and here is what you had to say. Sheldon, if you would. It's good to know who is your enemy and why, and understand the pain they are feeling. I think often when people lash out, I think mm -hmm. it's important that we listen and then find out why they're doing it, what's causing it, what, uh, mm -hmm. what's the intention. That, and yeah. then the next part is, you know, if, you, if there is any hope of connecting, you don't con necessarily condemn it. Sometimes you do, it depends whether that person has a lot of power or not. Yeah. If that person has a lot of power, then yes, you need to come you know, at it. But if it is your ordinary people, then you need to think about why are they doing all that? What is the inside Maybe because inside they're of... racist pigs? Y yes. Yeah. Is that and possible? Sex, and sex, and yeah. sexist yeah. pigs? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, I mean, you're the mayor now. Has anything changed about what you now see compared to back then? My approach is the same. Uh, yes, there are people that are full of anger. They feel alienated. Uh, they don't feel that the government is doing anything for them. They don't know why there should be a government. What we've done is open up City Hall. During the budget process, for example, we said, instead of us saying what we want to provide for you, why don't you come and tell us what you want? So they talked about public transit, building housing, safety, parks and recreation programs, libraries. Libraries are a sleeper on this one. People are saying, we want more library hours. I thought, wow. Uh, so we, through that whole process, listened to over 50,000 Torontonians, some online, others on telephone town halls. We have three nights of telephone town halls. How many racist many and sexist face -to -face. ones? Pardon? How many racist and sexist interactions did you have? Not much because they were screeners. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> uh, because those are public meetings, right? <clears throat> um, I still get occasional uh, emails and my public social media account, they are those. But uh, by, by hearing them, by opening up uh, City Hall for them, we have people that like to come to City Hall and yell. And I chair the... Some of them are on council. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. And, and they are full of fairy, uh, sound, and <laughs> not fairy. But, if I have some control over it, I give them the five minutes to hear them out. Okay, you mentioned safety in that answer there, and I want to pick up on that, because yeah. as you were going through the budget process, you sort of famously had a bit of a stand standoff with the police mm -hmm. who wanted more money, and you were saying, no, 
But then in the end, you acquiesced. How come? Well, because the money they want, if I don't get extra money, would have to come from housing dollars, public transit dollars, social services, libraries, childcare services, seniors, homes, all of these things that we operate. I don't want to go and cut something in order to give the police more, right? Because the police already is the top spender right. of our tax dollars. More than a billion dollars every year. Oh, 1.2, 1.3 billion, yeah. right? So this year they're getting at least 60, 70, oh, pardon me, 80 million dollars so, more, right? So why didn't, you, why didn't you stare them down for that 80 million? Uh, because I got extra dollars uh, I don't know if you remember a few about a week and a half before actual council day, the federal government had this summit in Ottawa, and just before the summit, it was about auto auto theft. Oh, yes, people are getting their car stolen, right? Mm -hmm. Whether through home invasion or just someone just parking beside you and grab your mm -hmm. keys and all that, and there's some violence and all that. So the federal government said we're going to contribute money to help solve it. I thought, aha, There's money federal provincial, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's so I found the money. Now tell me this, the, you, you famously also had a 9.5% tax increase this year on property taxpayers in the capital city, which is a, an historically high figure, you would acknowledge. And you explained that you needed more revenues to deal with the services that people want improved or new. My question is, should we anticipate going forward for the remainder of your term similarly high increases in the future? I don't know yet. I'll tell you why. Um, it is 8% is about 80 cents more per day for average homeowner. So yes, it is hefty percentage. 1.5% of it is really was established by former Mayor Rob Ford to build that Scarborough subway, still building that Scarborough subway. Mm. Uh, so the 1.5% was at from four to Tory to now Chow. That's the standard thing for building transit housing, okay? And the rest was the 8%, right? The 8% is what we contribute. I have to do it because I inherited a huge budget deficit. Yep. Budget hole, they call it, $1.8 billion. Thank God the provincial government said, we'll give you a deal, a new deal. They uploaded the Gardner and the DVP. Wow, that gives us more fiscal room. They said, you need TTC funds. I said, yes, I need it now. Not just capital, but operating dollars, because you need drivers to drive, we, we need to fix the, the, the subway system, right? So, so, and housing and shelters. So the provincial government came in, the federal government also gave us half a billion dollar on building housing. So I took all of that to deal with our deficit, but also deal with our top priorities of building housing and having better public transit. By the end of it, we still need that money, which is where the 8% increase, we still needed the money to continue to pay for the librarians, the recreation programs. So it's possible the city may go through that again next year. What I'm going through next year, this or well, this year actually, mm -hmm. is the same process. Opening up city hall so people are gonna come in and say, we want more service on this, this, that. Mm -hmm. In fact, tonight, I am speaking to the Toronto housing tenants, TCH. Toronto housing pe folks, because of where they live sometimes, or language, sometimes they, they're not participating. Their voices are not heard. So tonight, especially for them, for them to tell me and to each other what kind of service they valued most and how they want to improve their service. And then we'll expand on it We'll continue that process, find out what Torontonians want, see if we could get federal and provincial help, then we'll put the budget together. That, because, that, it, you know, it is people's first. In the past 10 years, there's always, we'll come up with a figure. Mm. You know, that figure first. 
That's not what people want. People want people first, their service first, and then the percentage will then get worked out. You, you, do you find that a great percentage of your job is just begging other people for money? <laughs> not completely. But a lot. But a, a, a good percentage is begging, but also celebrating what we mm. do in the city. We actually have one of the best library service in the world, mm. second best after Hong Kong. And in terms of per capita number of people, whether they use it online through Libby or Canopy or actually go into a, a library. That Libby uh, thing's not a bad app. You know, I get a lot there. I use it every day, yeah. actually. Okay, let me ask you about the refugee crisis, and I know you brought some information along. The feds have come up with 162 million for mm. new funding to cover your cost of housing people who are seeking asylum. How far is that gonna go? And maybe you could show the chart here to show yeah, what you're so dealing with. What, what, what this is, here, let me see if I could make sure people can see it well, is this chart, this is the homeless it, you see it's dropping, it's, it's steady. It's, we're it's keeping this under control. Line. Yeah, flat. we're keeping it under control, mm -hmm. right? We're building more housing to, to house them. But if you look at the show, this is refugees. The green one is refugees. It just keeps shooting up. And it's just growing and growing and growing. Now, there's almost 6,000 refugees in our shelter. Every night, mm -hmm. 11,000 people. And you have to pay for it. We have to pay for it. So you want more money out of the You got some money out of the I fence. got some money out of it, which is we're very, very grateful. They paid in full of what we spent last year. They had a down payment for this coming year. Again, very grateful. And it's not just this municipality. You hear the Quebec Premier talking about it. You hear uh, the Mayor of Brampton, Patrick Brown, talking about it. You're hearing uh, all through Ontario, especially in GTA. So um, we need to have a comprehensive settlement service because some of these refugees have a lot of skills. They can help us build housing. Some of them are engineers. They are, they are from all sectors and all walks of life. And we need to integrate them into our city as quickly as possible. They want to work. They have skills they could offer and we just need to shelter them and support them for a small period of time, get them on their feet. And do know that Toronto, remember the uh, Toronto Centre, the Irish refugees, because we, we're about to celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day soon. Mm -hmm. uh, the Irish refugees at the time, the city of York, which is Toronto before, we had 30,000 people. You know how many of them came I, from Ireland? 50,000 more than the, the number of people that were in York. Hmm. They helped build the city, right? So and we've been here before. In, we've done it before. The Southeast Asian refugees, remember the boat people? Sure, late 70s. Absolutely, yeah. 79. We had, at the end in Canada, we opened the doors to 220,000 Southeast Asian mm -hmm. refugees. They settled well. Yeah. They are now well, very okay. much part of our, our, our society. As long as we're talking about this, let me do a little tangent here, which is to say, you know, most mayors who get elected obviously have agendas on transit, on housing, on taxes, on a whole bunch of other stuff. They don't expect necessarily to have to deal with foreign affairs. You are quickly learning that you are needing to be very much involved in this, particularly since last October 7th and the Hamas attack on Israel. My question is, what does the mayor of Toronto see as her responsibility when there are protests around this city on a regular basis, some of which have gotten out of control, some of which have resulted in vandalism, many of which have resulted in people feeling unsafe? What do you do? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Steve, our motto is diversity, our strength. That is what Toronto is. That's the motto of the city. Absolutely. And we, we pride ourselves of this city, of living harmoniously together. It's not happening right now. By and large, it is. We have With some, some notable bad exceptions. actors. Bad actors, okay? Who are the bad so, actors right now? So the bad actors are the racists and or the folks that are hateful, anti-Semitic, 
and whether they're firebombing or, or vandalism on a, a store or a school, being having to evacuate and um, Jewish school, uh, or people putting graffiti on in mosque. So we see a rise of hate crime. Now we have laws against hate. We have law against criminal behavior. But what do you but see as your unique responsibility? My, my responsibility is to hold space to say that we hear and see each other. We feel each other pain. We need to not target people of who they are and what religion they believe in, but be empathetic and be hopeful and come together and support each other. Protest. Now that's easy to do, easy for to sure. say. For sure. But you know what though? It's those high profile incidents that get the media. But the small act of kindness that don't get seen. I went to a uh, a harmony dinner, uh, a concert at a synagogue. And I thought, wow, how how beautiful was that? Right? where people of faith come together. And, and there was a concert also at another, where, uh, again, all faith were coming together and sharing through music and art. So those are not what catches people's attention, but it is happening in our city. And, and we need to celebrate more of that, and those that are causing pain because people are hateful, we say no together, no matter who we are, what faith we have. In all walks of life, we say, no, this is not who we are. Torontonians, we are more empathetic and a lot more connected to each other than what appeared in the news. Okay, let's finish up on this because one of the uh, really interesting things about your time as mayor so far is that you are a former New Democrat member of Parliament. The current premier is a progressive conservative. The current prime minister is a liberal. And yet you seem to be, um, you seem to have pretty good relationships with both of those guys, despite your former partisan stripe differences. What is the secret to working well with people when you have, in some cases, significant ideological differences with them? Well, first thing, put away those ideological <laughs> stripes. You and think then, you've had to do that? But it's being empathetic. It's about finding common ground. There will always be things we don't agree with, but let's, let's not dwell in those. Let's look at what we want to do together. They all want to build housing faster. All right, let's look at how we're going to do that. Right? They want to have better transit. Okay, let's do that together. And the approaches might be different, but if the goal is the same, let's find a way to work together, which is wonderful. Once you find that common ground, it doesn't matter because they love this city. Doug Ford said the day before you got elected, you and I have talked about this before, it would be an unmitigated disaster if you won. Right? That's what he said. Unmitigated, yes. Unmitigated. Not just a disaster. <laughs> An unmitigated disaster. <laughs> yes. And yet here you are, and you two seem to be getting on just fine. Very well. So what happened? Well, we cut, a, cut through all that noise, right? Election is election, right? And what people say and what people do sometimes is different, right? Mm. People say things during election, right? I don't take it personally. I know Premier Ford loved the city. He lives in Etobicoke. Mm. Right? His parents lived in Etopico and loved the city and have contributed. So, okay, what is it that you would like to do, Premier? Oh, okay, safe housing, all right, public transit, all right, let's do it, let's do it. So we looked at how we're going to work together. He said, uh, you know, Mayor, I said, well, you know, upload those gardeners. Does it really make sense? They, they, if you come across Mississauga, you come to Toronto, it's the same gardener. Why is it that you're not dealing with it? Why is it that I'm, I am fixing it? Uh, well, he, he saw the logic. 
was and he it, uploaded the road. He uploaded yeah. the road. I said, okay, what do you need us to do, Mayor, uh, uh, Premier? He said, well, okay, Mayor, I need you to. Uh, yes, okay, all right. Mm. Some I can do, some I cannot do. All right, let's let's work together. But so, you didn't see that coming. No, we we. You know, this thing about, yes, you and I have both been in the political realm for many years. If we are not hopeful kind of people, optimistic, we have, we're in the wrong business. You have always have to be hopeful to say that once you connect, once you're empathetic and understand each other's needs, we can then move forward and put away all the differences. That's how politics happens. That's how magic can happen. And, you know, it's the art of what's possible. And stay hopeful. And the other thing is this. Another one of my core beliefs through all the years, we are stronger together. And sure we are. If we're spending all our energy fighting and, you know, hit <laughs> verbally, what good is it? We are stronger together. Whether we are at council, we are citizens together, both sides against each other because of ideology, ideology, religion. Put that aside. Let's work together because we are stronger. And by gosh, this city need all of us, all hands on deck, and that's what's happening. That is the 66th mayor of the city of Toronto, Olivia Chow. Your worship, it's really good of you to spend so much time with us at TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. It's something no one, especially in rural and northern Ontario, wants to hear. More doctors leaving their practice. According to the Ontario Medical Association, some 2.3 million people don't have a family doctor in this province. That shortage gets worse the further north you go. Dr. Danica Switzer is a rural generalist who recently left her practice in the north. She joins us now from Algoma for insight into why this is happening and what might be done about it. Uh, Dr. Switzer, it's good to meet you. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. Thank you so much for inviting me. Not at all. Happy to have you here. Just let's start with sort of basically where the rubber hits the road. What does the doctor shortage in Northern Ontario look like on a daily basis to you and the people who need to see you? So it's very difficult up here. We're short doctors at baseline. And in my town of Woe in particular, we're down to only uh, three doctors. And we had been two doctors for most of the fall. I closed my practice at the end of last summer because we were facing going down to being just not enough doctors. And where was your practice? It was in Wawa, Ontario, which is actually my hometown. So after finishing medical school and residency, I came back to Wawa and I practiced until last summer. How many patients did you have on your roster? I had about 650 patients. That sounds like a lot for one doctor, is it? Uh, it's less than, say, an office doctor in an urban area. In rural sites like Wawa and many other communities in, across Canada, family doctors are the only doctors in the communities. So we're doing office. We're also providing hospital care to our inpatients. We're covering the emergency department. We're doing palliative care. We're making home visits. We're taking on a lot of administrative roles, as well as teaching medical learners. Right. So 650 patients is a lot when you have all of these other jobs to do as well. Of course. How tough a call was it for you to make the decision to shut down your practice? It was very difficult because this is my hometown. My patients included lots of my family friends, uh, previous teachers, and deciding to close my practice, I really felt like I was abandoning not only the patients, but also my colleagues, leaving just two doctors practicing full-time in Wawa. So what you are doing now, this is a nice Latin word, which uh, I may need you to explain to us. You're doing a locum, L-O-C-U-M, a locum in medicine now. What is that? So locum is both a, a verb and a person uh, or a, a job. Essentially, it's a short-term position where you're kind of like a replacement doctor, just like a substitute teacher. So uh, there is a shortage of physicians in the north. So there are lots of um, practices looking for a short-term fill-in, looking for a locum. So I work as a locum physician, taking on the short-term contracts. Now, if you did a locum in southern Ontario, you, you could be doing it within six blocks and still going to a lot of different places. I bet in Northern Ontario, a locum is a little more complicated than that. You want to tell us how? 
Uh, yeah, so I have looked in Wawa, which is great because it's uh, a very short commute. And I've gone as far as Red Lake. Uh, Red Lake is just about as far as you can go in northwestern Ontario uh, by driving. I live in the north. I'm a day's drive from Toronto. And for me, Red Lake was a day and a half of driving. And Red Lake is just really short of positions as well. A day and a half of driving? A day and a half, 13 hours. And in the winter, I don't drive in the dark. So that's uh, a day and a half in winter time. My goodness. So you you actually can't get there in one fell swoop. I guess you're you're spending a night on the highway somewhere. Yes. Okay, that's dedication. Now, what does it mean to be a quote-unquote rural generalist? Um, so thank you for asking that. It's a term that rural family doctors are using to describe our broad scope, that we have a generalist set of skills. So this is where we're doing office work, but we're also doing the emergency department, the hospital work, inpatients. It's, I, I think it tries to get at the difficult medicine that is occurring in northern communities, there's sick patients, there's transport challenges, you're isolated geographically and professionally. And it's hinting at the broad skill set that is required, as well as the idea about clinical courage. So doing things that you're not comfortable with because that's what the patient needs. Now, I know you're, I mean, you just told us you feel a little bit guilty about shutting down your practice, but I gather you're doing this because, what, at the end of the day, you will be able to help more people in more places by doing it this way? Uh, so that's a difficult question, but it, it ultimately came down to, for me, the government refusing to provide meaningful long-term supports to rural practices. And I rationalized that it is not my personal responsibility to uphold an underfunded medical system. So I work extraordinarily hard as a full-time doctor. My colleagues who continue to work, work extraordinarily hard. As a locum, I think of it as working part-time, so I'm working less. Uh, which is preserving my physical health and giving me time to focus on other things like speaking with the media and advocacy efforts to try to get meaningful long-term change that we need in the North. I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but in some respects, this is a political statement meant to send a shot across the bow to the government. Is that fair to say? Um, I, I say it's not. It's that the government just refused to support us and it's not my job to fill in. It's not my job to do the work of two or three doctors in a town. And that's what the government expects up here because they're refusing to support communities when they lose physicians. Better support would look like what? So there's a few things, or there's many things I've done, but a few of them would be, I, I think that the challenge we're facing now is a retention issue. We're unable to keep the family physicians we have. You mentioned the shortage in the North. NOSM has a good data on this. So from 2021 until 2023, which is only two years, the need for rural general practitioners doubled from 100 to more than 200. So we're losing physicians more rapidly from the north than in other practice areas. And in order to retain these physicians, we need to provide more support. So more support, one key thing, would be continuing emergency department funding for rural sites. This is set to expire on March 31st. It's very easy for the government to agree to continue that. A second major issue is supporting existing physicians in practice by providing full locum coverage for until doctor positions, 100% coverage instead of the 15 to 50% coverage that's currently provided. And we need to be having teams of physicians and non-physician workers so that doctors can focus on doctor work and we have allied professionals to help with other work. You mentioned NOSM, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, and I suspect the government would say, hey, we created more positions at NOSM to train more doctors who will stay in the North and be helpful. Isn't that true? It's true in part. NOSM has made a big difference to putting physicians in the North, but more needs to be done. And I think one of the challenges emerging for NOSM is yes, they've made these seats, but we're running very low on physicians in the rural sites who are able to take learners. We know that sending learners into rural communities during the training makes them more likely to return and practice in the rural sites. But if you're down to two doctors, it's extraordinarily difficult to take on learners. I don't have to tell you that uh, upwards of 90 plus percent of the population in Ontario lives south of the French River. So let me put the call out to you to offer the majority some advice. What can people in the South do to help you out? 
they can be our allies. Just like you're spreading the word of the North, we need everyone to get on board with this. 90% of the population in Ontario is in the South. Uh, I think it's actually 94%. And 90% of the geography is in the North. So we need people in the South to care. We need them to recognize that the situation up here is a bit more desperate than it is in the South. We need them to recognize our expertise and we need them to amplify our voice for change. In the South, the practice closes, people can go to a walk-in. There's no walk-in up here. The doctors who work in the clinic are the same doctors working in the hospital, the same doctors providing all of their care everywhere. So I think it begins with educating to find out what the situation was. I think the second thing would be to listen to people who are up here about what they think solutions are and amplifying those voices. We've had challenges in the North for decades. I saw an article from the late 1990s talking about the challenges facing rural family doctors and the issues were the same that it could have been written this year. I think we have the evidence that there has not been a long-term strategy on Northern healthcare and we're past the time for requiring one. The Northern Policy Institute put out a paper in January talking about how Ontario could create a Northern Ontario Rural Coordination Centre, similar to what BC has, and the Rural Care Coordination Centre of BC. There was also the Auditor General's report released in December, which was skating for the current government on the issues in the North they have been ignoring. I think that to really solve the problems we're having in the North, we need a long-term plan, and that begins with unshelving the reports that go back to 2009 advocating for a Northern Health strategy. Gotcha. Well, we are happy to have you on TVO tonight to get that word out. So Dr. Danica Switzer, we thank you for joining us from Algoma, Ontario. Thank you. It's been over 30 years since the Invading Species Awareness Program began in Ontario. They are the front line when it comes to protecting Ontario from unwanted species. But a new creepy crawly threat looms in our waters. A creature that sheds its skin, lays 500 eggs at a time, and can clone itself. Meet the marbled crayfish. They may not look scary, but these little crustaceans have wildlife experts in Ontario on high alert. They're a big problem in Europe. They're spread all over there, even in Israel and in Madagascar as well in, uh, in Africa. Meet Premick Hammer. He's Ontario's leading expert on crayfish and dedicated over 40 years to researching them. In fact, he's known as Dr. Crayfish. A marbled crayfish is a crayfish that originated in the pet trade, actually, in, in Germany. We think uh, around the late 90s, we're not quite sure. There was a mutation, and this crayfish became uh, parthenogenic, which means asexual, which means that it's all females, and those females are all fertile. So they'll lay fertile eggs, and those fertile eggs will all be females, and they, they will then continue laying eggs. They don't need any males. Marbled crayfish range 10 to 12 centimeters in length, and to the average eye, look like many native crayfish here in the province. One big difference between the crayfish that you see in our streams here and them is the marbled pattern. So they have this really characteristic marbled pattern on the side of the carapace and on top and even on the tail. But also their claws are proportionately smaller to the body. They have quite kind of dainty, uh, longish claws. As of 2022, marbled crayfish are listed as a prohibited species under Ontario's Invasive Species Act. This means they cannot be bought, sold, traded, or kept in a home aquarium. However, according to the Invading Species Awareness Program, that's still happening. It was a very popular species in the aquarium trade, primarily due to the way that it reproduces. And so you had it in the aquarium trade both as a pet, uh, but as well as uh, food fish, or fish food, I should say. So because of the way it reproduces, you only need a few specimens, they reproduce, they, they create offspring. So you have a continuous supply of crayfishes to feed to you know, your pet fishes, let's say. Brooke Schreier is the assistant coordinator for the Invading Species Awareness Program. For over 30 years, the program has acted as a frontline defense against invasive species in Ontario. 
So we're an education program that was started in 1992 as a partnership program between the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry and the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. So back in the early 90s, we had the introduction of the invasive zebra mussel to Lake St. Clair. And at that point, the government said, we need to address this. We need to raise awareness in the province to try to mitigate its spread. From zebra mussels to newer threats like the marbled crayfish, the group's work is needed more than ever. Ontario is actually the most heavily invaded province out of any province in Canada, and that's primarily as a result of our history and the fact that we have the Great Lakes right there. So shipping was a, was a big culprit for introducing invasive species, um, especially via the St. Lawrence. In Ontario today, we have about 445 invasive terrestrial species. That includes bugs, plants, pathogens, and most recently, wild pigs. Wild pigs is a catch-all term that refers to escaped domestic pigs as well as wild boars, which were brought from Europe in the late 1980s to diversify Canada's livestock production. Recently, wild pigs have been causing havoc in Canada's prairie provinces, but luckily there are no established populations in Ontario, at least for now. If that changes, Brooks' team is sure to spot them. They receive a trail camera, a spy point trail camera. They receive all the necessary things. To Every year we have 50 volunteers who sign up, who receive uh, kits, which then they deploy, they bait uh, a location. We tell them what to look for in determining a site, and then they'll deploy their cameras, they'll monitor those cameras, and then they'll make sure that they report any potential sightings to us. When it comes to Ontario's waterways, Brooke says there are 185 non-native species. Of those, 10% are considered invasive, meaning they have extreme impacts on the environment and economy. While the impact of marbled crayfish has not been felt yet, Hammer and Schreier are worried about the potential harm to local habitats. There'll be competition for resources. They also uh, will eat uh, aquatic plants, so they could you know, damage the ecosystem. They'll eat snails, they'll eat uh, uh, insects. And so if they're increased in large numbers in water bodies, they could basically cut off the bottom of the food chain. If they burrow en masse, that can lead to erosion, uh, shoreline erosion, uh, those types of infrastructural damages, uh, particularly in urban environments. This is ground zero of the marbled crayfish invasion, City View Park in Burlington, Ontario. These ponds are the first places in North America where these tiny creatures were found in the wild. Back in late 2021, someone snapped a photo of a crayfish and shared it to iNaturalist, a citizen science tool in hopes of identifying it. And in this case, the individual did not know what it was, had reported the, the, the photo. It went for a few months without us finding it until Dr. Prema Kammer brought it to our attention. The following summer, I went to a World Crayfish Conference and I brought the picture with me and they identified it positively as a, as a marbled crayfish. That same year, Hammer and Schreier conducted a search of the pond and set traps, but came up empty-handed. The team collected samples using environmental DNA technology to find them. We do a lot of environmental DNA in our job where what we essentially do, just to break it down to its nuts and bolts, is collect water samples, put them through filters, then take those filters, send them to Trent University where Chris Wilson has his eDNA lab and he's able to process those samples to determine whether or not the DNA of that particular species is in that water. So there are limitations with eDNA because primarily what it's telling you is presence or absence. Is that species there? But if you do get a confirmed hit of DNA, you don't necessarily know what that specimen looks like. Right. Is it a dead specimen? Is it a living specimen? Is it a bird that ate some of it and then defecated? So there's no real way of knowing, but it's still a smoke alarm and it's telling us that we need to keep looking. Despite positive eDNA tests, it would be another summer before the team finally saw an actual crayfish. The group captured dozens of marbled crayfish at the site in the months that followed. However, wiping out these rapidly self-cloning crustaceans would need a tougher approach. Over the winter, city workers drained the ponds in an attempt to freeze out the invasive crayfish. It's believed they can survive temperatures as low as 4 degrees Celsius, but any colder and they go dormant and painlessly freeze to death. 
So luckily these ponds are self-contained, they're storm water ponds, so they're not connected to any stream or anything. So that's one of the good things about this whole thing. By draining the ponds down to as low as possible, we were hoping that it would freeze the mud and the crayfish, they burrow, they make burrows, so they can make shallow burrows and escape. That's how frogs and other things also survive our winters. And so we were hoping if we lower the water, it, it, would, it would freeze them and they would die. The team has had good success so far, with the dead crayfish carcasses littering the pond's edge to prove it. But warmer winter temperatures have been a challenge. You need to hope that when you do drain those ponds, that one, you're able to drain them low enough that you're going to freeze those crayfish out of their burrows, uh, but then also for a long enough period of time that they're actually exposed long enough to then cause, you know, death. It's not clear how the marbled crayfish ended up in Burlington, but it's suspected that someone illegally owned one or more and released them into the storm ponds. Wildlife officials are aware that even though they are prohibited, the crayfish are still being sold and purchased in Ontario. We're still seeing sales online, whether it's uh, Facebook Marketplace uh, or if it's places like Kijiji. Those are the areas where we're seeing those ads pop up. And each time we see one, what we're doing is our due diligence to make sure that we're contacting the authorities, uh, the proper authorities, the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, to inform them of these sales that are going on that are in contravention to the Invasive Species Act. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry says it's taking an education-first approach and have not laid any charges so far. I think the level of knowledge around marble crayfish is, is kind of 50-50. Some people know that it's a problem and unfortunately have continued to try to sell it, whereas others just don't know at all. And that's where you know organizations like mine come in, where we're trying to elevate that education and outreach component. The team cannot be certain that the ponds in Burlington are the only place in the province where population has been established. That's why Hammer and Schreier plan to work with conservation authorities along the Great Lakes to defend Ontario's shorelines from these alien creatures. Next up, we're traveling to Acton and Guelph, where we look at an unusual tool that helps process grief. It's a phone that doesn't actually call anyone. One day I was walking along the pond path and it goes into the, into the forest and it's just quite magical in there and it's just wandering around just kind of mesmerized by the trees and then off to the right there's this booth, this little thing and there's a phone, like the old school phone with the rotary. It's strange to come upon a phone in the middle of nowhere. For one moment I thought, could this be an emergency situation? No, it was a phone to talk to the dead. I have been working with people who are dying for my entire career. So I would say I've probably worked with thousands of people at the end of life as a music therapist. And so when I picked up the phone, I, I was like struck by who would I want to hear from? Who would I want to interact with? Um, where are you? How has it been? You know, I, I was sort of flooded by a memory of a, a lot of different people. It looks like the life that I shared with mom and dad for so many years. My name is Catherine Manning and I am a music therapist and I live and work in Guelph, Ontario. So I work at Hospice Wellington, which is a beautiful hospice facility offering um, 10 beds and end of life support for, for folks with wonderful nursing and healthcare support. I'm Linda, Linda Clark. Uh, I live here in Guelph. I'm Peter and Jerry Clark's daughter. I came upon Keith's wind phone in June of last year. And uh, even though my parents died six years ago, grief is ongoing and uh, the wind phone was a really sweet and important part of that. Well, I think what's really neat about the wind phone is that uh, it's, it's an access point for an expression of grief or to externalize our grief. They provide an avenue to interact with our grief. Um, I, I have a sense of them being um, like a side door to uh, encounter feelings that we have around the losses that we have. In the wake of a death, people are in an altered state. Having opportunities for encounters with nature, beauty, aesthetics, the arts, um, and the wind phones, it's something of a symbolic intermediary as something that you can interact with through another means. 
what's difficult sometimes with grief and bereavement or with losing somebody is that to look at it straight on is very difficult, especially when you're in that state of shock or a raw state uh, afterwards. A wind phone in the woods is really uh, an interesting invitation. Uh, first of all, being in the woods opens your senses. It allows you to enter into a bit of a different space, a liminal space, where all of the old rules don't apply and it allows you to touch base with um, the deeper mystical side of life. When you lose somebody, there's an ephemeral quality to the, to the loss. It's very helpful in the process of adjusting to that new reality to have tools or practices that allow you to interact with the shift. So there's a feeling of walking away from regular world, regular life. There is that physical beauty of these trees that go higher and higher. And it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. For my mom, not unusual for women of her time, the phone was her lifeline forever. So many of the memories I have of mom are sitting at the table talking on the phone, picking up the phone. Who am I talking to today? My father was always, okay then, <laughs> handing it over to somebody else. But it was that phone, and there was, there was a feeling of familiarity, which is lovely, actually lovely. My name's Keith Lamont. Uh, we're at Thistlestone Farm. I've uh, been here for 45 years. For that time, it's been a sheep breeding operation in our home. And for the last 10 years, also we host uh, guests who come and stay with us. So I installed the wind phone this past March. And uh, I had read about a Canadian physician on the prairies. She sponsored one on a trail for the benefit of her patients. She thought they might embrace this opportunity to pick up a phone and talk to somebody. My wife and I, in 1979, were working in jobs in the city, and we embraced the opportunity to come here and put this farm to use. In around 2005, my wife entered, at about 51 years of age, uh, into the start of young onset dementia. And for about 10 years after that, she was able to continue to live here. And for the last three years of those 10, I had PSWs before Mary entered into a long-term care center and died in 2022. So uh, this wind phone was around the diagnosis time when life is full of turmoil. If I'd discovered something like that on my own, I would have just let loose to that. That's all past for me because there was a lot of ambiguous loss, times when you're losing another aspect of that person. This is a new endeavor for me and I did some exploration when I discovered about wind phones. The original in Japan goes back a while and I didn't realize there was so many wind phones. I understand there's one in Guelph, and there's one in Mississauga, and there's one here, and there's one in a small village. They're for the public t just to pick up and use as they're walking by in a public space. I don't advertise the fact the wind phone's there. I want people just to discover it. So all the reward for me for this is now hearing people's response to discovering the wind phone. When I came upon Keith's wind phone, I was astonished, would be the first, the first word. I was astonished. Um, the trees were what a friend of mine would call cathedral trees. It's a very uh, quiet, secluded spot. So I was curious. I was shy. I looked around. I was reluctant. Because I knew there's not going to be anybody at, on the other end. But uh, when you lose somebody, you keep wishing that you'd hear their voice or you'd catch a glimpse of them. And there's always a little part of me that's listening for something like that. So I looked around and there was nobody there. And I thought, OK, I'll just try this. And I got up and I read the, the uh, engraving. And, um, and it was lovely. And I, and I picked it up. And of course, there's nothing, absolutely nothing, of course, on the other end. And I thought, oh, this is, this is stupid. And I hung up and I walked away. And a couple of days passed. Uh, we were staying at Keith's farm. And I thought, go back to the wind phone and have an open mind. 
see if something happens. So I retrace my steps, um, again appreciating, and even now remembering it, appreciating the sounds, the top of the trees and the smells of the forest and all the rest of it. And I stood there in front of that phone and I picked it up and I spoke and I said something. Actually, I remember very well what I said. I said, hi, Mom and Dad. It's Linda. We're all fine. We're all fine. We sure miss you. Uh, we wonder if you're okay. Um, gee, I wish you could come back and tell us we had done a good thing. Uh, love you. Bye. And then I walked away. It stimulated memories that I hadn't thought about for a long time. So the wind phone really does work. It brings you back to places with the loved ones that you're thinking of. And for me, it was mom and dad. Um, and all sorts of memories came back and all sorts of images, um, joyful, the difficult ones, all those ones came back. And you realize, ah, that's what the wind phone is for. It's to connect us in that way. I knew that it wasn't going to quote unquote cure my grief. There's no cure for grief. Time changes it, but time doesn't take it away. Um, my grief is as familiar to me as my hand is. The education around grieving is minimal. And I mean, we all experience it. And somehow when we experience it, it segregates us. Shouldn't you be over that by now? It makes me smile and occasionally giggle that, you know, I was in the middle of the woods at our friend's farm and I was laughing because I was using the phone to talk to my parents and I knew they weren't there, but it was important to me. So it's really touching on something that we need. Uh, and, and maybe, I mean, I'm not a person, I'm not a religious person. I don't go to church and all the rest of it. Perhaps that's what, what's lacking is that uh, ritual that goes around saying goodbye to people that we love. Tomorrow on the agenda. As you and I both know, some days your tongue doesn't work and you just can't get the words out. And he had one of those moments. Uh, yes, absolutely. And unfortunately, when you're speaking uh, live to uh, a camera and the hanser, you don't uh, get to edit the, your flubs out. <laughs> That's tomorrow on the agenda.